was, if you recall, um, what happens if you're trying to get information out of experts and the experts uh, are then going to be affected by the decision that's made uh, based on the information that they've given. Now what I'm going to talk about is actually something in that direction, although with a very different model than the model that you just saw previously. In fact, the biggest difference about the model is that we're not going to use payments in the model that we're talking about here. And, and of course, they were talking about payments in the previous paper. Um, so we're looking at a different model. It's a model that's uh, inspired by machine learning, which some of you are more familiar with, some are less familiar with. Um, but um, I'm going to try to get you to wrap your minds around a slightly different model of, um, in, when we talk about strategy proof uh, classification. This is based on a series of papers, the, uh, the most recent of which uh, was uh, authored by Reshef Meyer, uh, Shaul Almagor, Asaf Michaeli, and myself. Um, I put Ariel Prakach's name here as well because he was involved in some of the earlier papers on which we're building. And in fact, I'm quoting here from a, uh, several of the papers, uh, rather uh, arbitrarily uh, cherry picking from here and from there in order to build the talk. So there is uh, material that also came from Ariel as well as from Reshef, Shaul, and Asaf. And Reshef is sitting right over there. So just a quick uh, outline of what I'll be talking about in strategy proof classification. I'll give an example of what I mean by strategy proof classification and classification in general. Um, I'll talk about motivation in the real world for a couple of slides. Uh, then I'll talk about our model and some previous results. And then I'll present some positive and negative results, including uh, proving a lower bound on strategy proof classification, uh, looking briefly at the weighted case. And finally, if we have time, I'll uh, try to generalize a little bit into probability distribution. So. Um, the motivating question here for the overall talk is, uh, do strategy proof considerations apply to machine learning? Uh, in other words, we're trying to look at a machine learning scenario and see whether we can take the ideas of strategy proofness and impose them onto the machine learning scenario. And if the agents in a machine learning scenario have an incentive to lie, what can we do about it? And we'll see we'll be using approximation, randomization, some more things. OK, so this is the basic, the basic scenario. We have a bunch of points uh, which are labeled. And what we're trying to do is to fit or, or partition the space into uh, classes. In this case, we'd be wanting to partition the space, the overall space, into positive and negative areas. And uh, we have to use some pre-existing concept class. But this is our concept here, this particular curve. And what we're trying to do is fit it in a way that is going to minimize uh, what we call there the uh, empirical risk, empirical risk minimization, the ERM. So what we've got is this curve or, or some set of uh, concepts that we can use, and we're going to try to fit it into the space in a way that minimizes uh, the, the risk or the mistakes in our case. Okay, so here we have a nice uh, two-dimensional uh, plane, and we're trying to uh, figure out where to put that, and we see that we have some mistakes. Okay, this happens to be the best thing that we can do, but we've got a negative over here and a negative over here. And this region down here is the positive region. So we've got two negatives in the positive region. And we've got three positives in the negative region. But that's really the best we can do. Five errors all together. And that's the best we can do. So far, so good. This is classical machine learning, one way of looking at the problem. And, uh, and this is very simple. Now we ask the question, what if, instead of being simply given all of these points, and that's, in fact, one possible scenario in the machine learning, uh, supervised learning, we're given these points with the labels. Instead of that, we actually have agents that are controlling the points and giving the information to the machine learning algorithm. So for example, we've got a red agent and a blue agent. And the red agent controls some of the points in the plane. That is to say, knows about some of the points in the plane. And the blue agent knows about some of the points in the plane. And the machine learning algorithm comes along and says, OK, agents, provide me with the information that I need in order to do my learning, to do my classification. So they provide the information. If they're truthful, they would provide the same information that we had before, let's say, in this example. And the ERM comes over here and has five errors, exactly what we saw. But as you can see here, the errors are not exactly the same. There's, well, we see that there's, um, it's pretty good for the blue. The blue has one thing over here, right, that's in the wrong region. Uh, red, unfortunately, has a minus and a minus in the plus region. And it's not too happy about that. And not only that, but it thinks to itself, you know, there is a better classifier for me. Right? It's not a better global classifier, but it's a better classifier for the red agent. So all he has to do in order to get the machine learning algorithm to specify a different concept here is to take a couple of these points, let's say the two points that it controls, that minus and that plus. Remember, it's plus up there and minus down there. And he's going to lie about them. Right? So inside is now the lie. 
and what's going around it is the truth. So now he's put a minus over there and a plus over there, and our naive machine learning algorithm presented with this information chooses a different, if I push it right, a different ERM. And that now minimizes the risk. Now, they're actually, it's worse, right? It actually has seven errors altogether, but it seems to be better, and in particular, it's better for him. Now the only problem that he's got, uh, right, he's got two errors instead of three errors, if I got that correct, that he had in the previous slide, okay? Just that plus over there, which is actually a minus, and the minus, which is actually a plus, right? So he's happier. So this is the basic idea, okay? We're trying to figure out, can we set up algorithms for classification, for machine learning, that will incentivize these agents to tell the truth, but without payments, and I'll keep coming back to that. Uh, okay, so what's our classification problem? The supervised classification problem involves, as an input, a set of labeled data points, and despite the fact that I just wrote, I just showed you a plane, and I wrote x, uh, y over here, it's not x, y as the data point, actually x is a vector, such as a point on the plane, an x, y point on the plane, and y is the label. Okay, so what we get is vectors in the space, and some label on the vectors, uh, and the output then is going to be a classifier C from some predefined concept class C, and in machine learning it's very important that this be a predefined concept class uh, for a variety of reasons. For example, just as one example, we'll use this repeatedly during the talk, uh, you might have something that takes those input points along with the labels, all the input points together with the labels, that's big X, and then decides on a minus or a plus. A very simple concept class has two members and labels the entire space minus or the entire space plus. It's not what we did in the previous example. We actually put a, a function through it and had two regions. But here, this is a simpler one, right? It just says everything's plus or everything's minus. Okay, that would be a concept class. Um, usually what we want to do is have a classifier that's going to correctly classify not just a sample but actually to be a nice generalization over the space and uh, minimize uh, the expected number of errors with respect to the distribution that we have. We'll be using a zero one loss function here, which just counts up the number of incorrect points. Points that are plus that are labeled minus in our example, or minus that are labeled plus. Okay, um, so a very common approach is to do what I just showed you in that simple example, which is to return the empirical risk minimizer. Um, and uh, what we've got basically is a set of points that are handed to the algorithm, and it's trying to decide uh, what the, best, uh, what the best concept is from the concept class, you know, with the given samples. In other words, one that has the lowest number of errors. We are not, although we will talk about this later, uh, uh, sampling the distribution or sampling a distribution in order to get the points ourselves. Uh, we're just being handed a whole lump of points and we have to do something with it. Um, under some assumptions of concept class and machine learning, this uh, generalizes well, for example, like with linear classifiers. Um, but we've already seen that we have a problem. We have multiple experts controlling the data points that we can't trust the uh, empirical risk minimizer. So we want to do something about that. So one question might be, well, where would you find this in the real world? I mean, is this something realistic? In fact, we believe that it is. Um, take as an example uh, some kind of a company that's learning purchase patterns. So there are all these stores, uh, retailers, that are feeding information into the parent corporation and they're gathering all sorts of information about buying patterns and so on and so forth. And that's going to go into some kind of learning algorithm which is going to learn something from that. And that's going to affect ad campaigns. And the ad campaigns are then going to affect, obviously, buyers' decisions. But a particular store might have an incentive to have an ad campaign that was biased in a certain direction and might provide information to the parent company that would bias the ultimate <laughs> ad campaign because the decision that's made from the learning algorithm feeds back into the experts that are providing the information. Another example of that, right, the best policy is the policy that fits my pattern. Another possibility there is on the internet where users are providing information in a poll uh, and there's questions that they have to answer, there's some kind of a, of a form they have to fill out and providing this information is then used by the company that did it to get some kind of uh, information, some kind of classifier, which is to be fed back into a policy that affects those internet users and the users become turned to the dark side and put wrong information into their form, and then we have a corrupted data set. Okay, so we consider this to be fairly realistic kinds of examples. We want to set up a system where, you know, ideally, there would be no incentive for them to tell the wrong thing. Okay, we started working on this in the area of machine learning 
but um, found along the way that it actually had direct connections to other kinds of problems. Uh, very briefly, um, there's work that's being done now by, I believe, Ilan Nechama and maybe Michal also, on aggregating partitions. Uh, this is related very much to the work that we're talking about, I'm talking about today. Uh, the idea is to have agents reporting on partitions in some space and then trying to aggregate them according to some rules. Might be a majority rule, might be something else. Uh, judgment aggregation uh, is also related to this where you have different experts providing information and then you want to come to some conclusion of the group. Uh, and finally, facility location on n-dimensional binary cube, uh, similar kind of problems. So here's an input example. Now one of the things that has distinguished uh, different pieces of the work that we've done has been whether uh, the experts are all uh, controlling different points like in the original example that I gave you or whether there's a set of points which are shared among all the experts and each expert is providing some information about each of those points. Okay, so actually that's going to be the model I'm talking about today. Uh, we're going to assume that there's a fixed set of points but each expert might have different opinions about those points. So this is, these are all exactly the same points in space in this example, but each agent has its own ideas about whether it should be plus or minus and are going to report whatever they want to report. So we'll call X the set. Hmm? Yeah, there are small minuses and big minuses only because of my problems with PowerPoint. Uh, <laughs> nothing else. Also the fact that I did this on a Mac and it's now sitting on a PC with a big Apple on the back, but uh, no. No other connection. Okay, so, and the labels, of course. We've got the labels, and then we have some sample set, which is actually the, all of the samples together and all of the different points with their labels. X is the point, Y is the label on that point, and so on and so forth, so it's very, very simple. Okay, what do we want from a mechanism? So a mechanism, in our case, is an algorithm. It's a black box, which is going to receive this label data set S, and it's gonna output some concept C from the concept class that we've got, the predefined concept class, and um, we're gonna call the private risk of I, the number of mistakes, the proportional number, percent of number of mistakes that are made in the data set for I. Um, and we're going to say the total risk, the global risk, is over all of the agents, all the mistakes that are made for all of the agents in the whole data set. Or in other words, the percent of errors on SI, which is a sample set of, of as viewed by, uh, by agent I. <coughs> and the global risk is over the entire set. Okay. Um, I'm putting in no payments again and again because I want to uh, forestall any questions about why we don't use VCG. Um, but our mechanisms are assumed not to use payments and this is actually a, a slightly deeper uh, issue because this line of research is part of a broader uh, research agenda which was really launched by uh, Ariel Prakacha together with Moshe Tenenholtz and some other people in the past few years looking at approximate mechanism design without money. Uh, which is their name for it. So the idea is to design mechanisms that have certain good approximation properties, uh, but to do it without money so that they're suitable for situations like the current internet where we can't assume that the users that are providing information are going to be paid for the information. That's infeasible, uh, impossible, immoral, whatever. Um, the information is, is coming in, but there's no uh, reverse mechanism of payment. Um, We'll also be allowing non-deterministic me mechanisms, and when we do that, we'll be uh, measuring the expected risk, despite the fact that we're using non-deterministic non mechanisms. This is not in the sense of pack learning. It's not trying to bound uh, the, the error right, with some probability, uh, the size of the error with some probability, but rather we're simply talking about expected risk. So in our sense, because we're looking at risk as the number of mislabeled samples, the zero one loss function, we're talking about the expectation of how many are going to be mislabeled. Okay, it's very simple. Okay, now uh, we're going to have this, uh, this ERM, this empirical risk minimizer, and we want some baseline in order to compare how well we're doing. So what is the baseline? So the baseline for us is going to be this best concept given the real, given the, the set of, uh, of, of input, and we're going to choose the concept from the concept class that minimizes that risk over that that data set. So we're going to call R star that ideal minimal risk and C star is the wonderful concept from the concept class that gave us that minimal risk and that's our baseline. That's where we're going to be comparing uh, our mechanisms output to. Okay, so in this case we saw what happened. We got some input. And this is a case with, with separate points. It's the same idea and we have a certain number of errors and that's going to be our R star and we saw that uh, we have a problem where the, uh, I'll answer the question, the mechanism can't simply compute and return the ERM because of the problem with the 
uh, agents misreporting. So, requirements. What we're trying to get from, yeah, this is really, this should telegraph something to you. Um, what we want from our mechanism. First thing is, we'd like it to be a good approximation. So we'd like there to be a constant approximation, a nice small alpha preferably, so that over all possible data sets, um, the risk that the mechanism generates on that data set will be uh, less than or equal to some nice small constant factor alpha times R star, which is like our ideal, right? Our, our baseline risk. Um, the other thing is we'd like strategy proofness, right? We like the situation where lying is, no be is not better, right? I'm sorry to say, the risk of lying is higher than the risk of telling the truth. In other words, the number of errors that are generated for an agent I is higher than the risk that's generated for the agent if it tells the truth, right? Just written out. Um, now, we've already seen some possibilities. One is to actually take the ERM. Uh, if it's given the true information, it's one approximating, but it's not strategy proof. Uh, we could also just randomly choose uh, the first agent, right? And say, okay, agent one, we're going to use whatever you gave us. Uh, but it's an SP, right? Because nobody has any reason to, uh, to lie about that, neither S1 nor anybody else. But uh, it gives a terrible approximation. Could give a terrible approximation the size of the set of points. Uh, and I'll mention one more time, no monetary transfer. So keep working that in. Uh, okay, are there any mechanisms that guarantee both strategy proofness and good approximation given the model that I've shown you? Okay, so let's look at some related work. Um, I'm going to answer these questions in, in bits and pieces, but let's start out with uh, some related work. Uh, this was actually uh, some of the earliest work on the, on the whole area of learning uh, with uh, strategy proofness. This was work done by Deckel, Fisher, and Procaccia. Uh, it was a supervised learning scenario, but it was aggression, uh, regression learning uh, rather than a classification scenario in machine learning where you're taking a function and trying to fit it as closely as possible. Yeah. 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 Presumably, look, presumably there's, there's some, there's true information that they could be providing and the mechanism could then use the true information in order to decide how to uh, minimize risk. So let's say, for example, um, a majority function. So you might have an agent giving a plus, another one giving a plus, another one giving a minus, and the function then does something with that. But you might have one of those pluses turning and becoming a minus. So there is a true set of information which the mechanism will be using, but that could be then distorted by the agents. But it's over the same set of points. But it, that's, that's not actually so important right now. But uh, On the, if the true information was provided by the agents, the mechanism would take that input and decide something. Right. Huh? Right. 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 Is, is that clear? There's, there is true information in the sense that there's what everybody sees. And it's the same thing with like with that picture with the, the blue and the red. Everybody sees things, right? That's what they really believe. If it's given to the mechanism, the mechanism will decide something based on that information, right? So the fact that there are some pluses over here and some minuses over there is sort of irrelevant. They're, you're giving, they're giving the true information as they see it. And the mechanism makes a decision. It says, okay, let's put the line over here. Or let's, let's say plus for everything, whatever, whatever the class is, right? Whatever the concept class is. Beyond that, they might distort what they report. But there is a non-distorted input which the mechanism could use and then minimize its risk. That's R star. Yes, I think the question is if you have different agents have different uh, labels for the same point, yeah. what's the truth? The and truth is that label with multiple, th that point with multiple labels. That's right. The truth is, yeah. Right? I have a co-author in the, in the audience if he wants to chime in. <laughs> Right. Right. Sergio is right. Yeah, yeah, right. But, but there is a truth, right? There is truth out there, right? There is truth and there is falsehood, right? No, that, they, no, Reshef gave a good example. You have a single point. It's labeled by three agents. You have two of them labeling it plus and you have one of them labeling it minus. What's the ERM? Label it plus. You want to minimize the number of mistakes. Well, it's making one mistake. That is, there's one mislabeled 
characterization of the point, but that's the data. That's the true data. If one of the pluses turns into a minus, I'm getting distorted data. We'll, we'll get to that later. We'll get to that later. It, it comes up in two examples later on, I think. Uh, it'll answer your question. Okay? Another example was uh, previous work that was done on, on uh, unsupervised learning where there's not labels on the input data. Okay, so you have data and it has to be uh, put it into, uh, into clusters. Uh, this is unsupervised learning and it was shown that under certain weak assumptions, there are no strategy proof mechanisms. God, it's going fast. Okay, let's go on. Uh, also, SP aggregation rules. All right. Let's look at a very simple case here. Just to get some, uh, some feeling about this, let's say we had a really tiny uh, concept class that had just two possibilities, labeling everything plus or labeling everything minus. Okay? That's, that, that's what the mechanism is going to do. Um, so we prove a theorem in one of these papers. It's, it's previous work from the latest work, but there is an SP2 approximation mechanism for this. Okay? So it it's encourages its strategy proof on the part of the agents, um, and it gives a true approximation to the R star. Okay? And there's no SP uh, approximations that are uh, uh, better than that. Alpha approximations uh, are better than the true approximation. But let me give you an example to, uh, to motivate this, and maybe I'll also give you a little motivation about how we're comp uh, computing the ERM. Um, you know, in this middle case, where we have the same set of five points, but they're labeled by the two agents, right? And this one's labeling them all minus, and this one's labeling them all plus. And it really doesn't matter what the mechanism does in this case, because it can say plus, it can say minus, it's going to have an ERM of five. It can put probabilities on them, it really doesn't matter. It's going to come out the same way, right? Now, if we look over here on the left side, we have pluses all the way up there. They're all, they're, they should be thought of as superimposed on each other, okay, for this uh, problem. And we have minuses over here and we have pluses over there. Now, this agent over here actually thinks, you know, that there are a few minuses. In fact, he thinks that they're mostly minuses. And he knows that the concept class is either all plus or all minus. So he would really like for the concept class to be all minus. But he also, obviously, he believes that there are two pluses there in the input set as well. So let's say, as an example, that the mechanism decided to label, take the majority of each agent. That is to say, I'll just take the majority here. It'll be minus. And I'll take the majority here, which is plus, and I will weight them each with a half, each with 50% probability. Okay, so what's our ERM in those circumstances? Let's say we have, it's weighted plus. Okay, how many mistakes do we have? Well, we have a quarter, roughly, of the possible points, right, that are mislabeled, roughly. And if we label it minus, we're going to have three quarters mislabeled, correct? So it's 50% probability of three quarters getting wrong and 50% probability of one quarter getting wrong. So how much is wrong? Expectation? Half. Okay? Half the points are mislabeled in expectation using that particular mechanism. What if I just label this correctly using the correct information? I'd label it plus and I'd have one quarter. Right, an expectation. So the mechanism that I showed you, which says take the majority over here and the majority over here and give them each 50%, is twice as bad. Expectation is one half instead of expectation being one quarter. Okay, and we have exactly the symmetric situation over here. Okay? Now the question is, we don't want, right, this one would be plus and this one would be minus in the best situation. The question is, what happens to an agent who has the possibility of lying about some of the points and sending himself into this alternative space? And how could I improve the ERM over here from the mechanism that I proposed of saying 50-50 by majority of each agent's reporting? I would have to wait plus more over here in order to improve the ERM, right? I'd have to wait him more. Over here, I'd have to wait the minus more in order to improve it. Right? And that would incentivize switching over to here, but the mechanism can't differentiate between these different cases because it wants to keep strategy proofness. 
Therefore, if we have plus with enlarged possibility over here and minus with enlarged possibility over here, but we can't differentiate between the cases, then we've got a contradiction in the middle. We can't enlarge the plus on the left side or enlarge the minus on the right side without um, needing basically to keep the middle one undifferentiated between the two side possibilities in order to keep strategy proofness. And we can't have the middle one both have plus higher probability and lower probability. Just a sketch. OK, we got a lot of nods. Good. I wasn't sure that was going to be clear, but it was. Good. Um, OK, um, what about more general concept classes? Instead of just a, a two concept class, tiny one that just has plus and minus. So selecting a dictator at random, OK, is strategy proof and guarantees a 3 minus 2 over n approximation. This is previous work. It's true for any concept class C. But there were still some open questions, including were, are there any better mechanisms? Uh, what, if, what do we do if the agents are weighted? Because so far I've just been talking about the agents as if they had the same weight in the decision mechanism. Uh, treated them as, as equally weighted. Uh, and does it generalize for every uh, possible distribution? So the main result from the most recent work is a lower bound okay, on this approximation mechanism. And the result is uh, there is a concept, there exists a concept class C where the concept class is of size 3, bigger than the previous one for which any strategy proof mechanism has an approximation ratio of at least 3 minus 2 over n. I want to show you, uh, this actually matches the upper bound from, uh, from a previous paper that we had. Uh, and it's going to be, uh, I'm going to show you the proof sketch by uh, uh, reducing it to a uh, voting scenario. And let's look at quickly what it looks like. So um, there's a famous uh, result by Gibbard in 1977, after the Gibbard status weight uh, theorems. Uh, which proved that every randomized strategy, uh, strategy proof voting rule for three candidates has to be a lottery over dictators. Not unlike uh, Roger Maris's uh, 61 home runs, which always carried an asterisk with it, uh, this statement carries an asterisk too because it's actually a simplification of, the, uh, of what Gibbard actually said. Uh, but that's okay because uh, what he actually said is also part of our, our proof. Uh, but I just wanted it to be a little simpler here, okay? So any Every randomized strategy proof voting rule for three candidates has to be a lottery over dictators. So you basically are going to say, with a certain probability, I'll choose this agent, and we're going to do whatever he says, or we'll choose this agent, and we're going to do whatever he says, and, you know, and so on. And it'll be a lottery uh, that can be weighted somehow. Um, so what do we do? We take our concept class uh, C, and we have three members in it, which is C, X, C, Y, and C, Z. And there are only three points, X, Y, and Z. right? And we're going to. Uh, set it up so that the agents, when they look at this, uh, are allowed to have a positive region and negative region and one mixed region. So for example, here we have two agents who are looking at these points and they have all negative labels on the X over there, in the top row, a mixed section on the Y row and an all plus uh, section on Z. And then when we have this kind of a situation, we have, now we assume that we want a mechanism that goes over this, okay, and labels it, minimizing the ERM, um, and it's strategy proof. So what we really have here is a kind of ordering, right, in terms of the, of the pluses. So for example, the top agent says Z is first, then Y, then X, and the bottom one says X, and then Z, and then Y. And the proof in the paper goes through the following steps. First of all, it says that the mechanism has to be monotone on the fixed point. Okay, increasing it only increases the chances um, of its uh, being chosen. Uh, M has to ignore the mixed point, and what that means is that we've really got a randomized voting rule. Okay, and therefore, if the mechanism is strategy proof, then it's going to have to, according to the Gibbard theorem, is going to have to be uh, a random dictator. Okay, over there again, quick sketch, but that's what that's what the proof in the paper goes by. Um, right, and the next thing is to construct a set of instances where the random dictators perform poorly, and, um, and we've got our proof. Right. Uh, briefly, weighted agents. Uh, until now, we've talked about all the agents as having the same weight and being treated the same way by the mechanism. Uh, we select a dictator randomly, but the weighted agents could affect the probabilities that we use in the lottery to choose among the different agents. Because we say we had a weighted lottery, so the weights of the agents uh, could affect that, will be actually, will affect that. The naive approach is just to take the probability of an agent as being proportional to its weight. But that actually is not the best that we can do. That gives us a three approximation. 
if we instead take the proportional, take the weight of the agent to be, I'm sorry, the uh, probability of the agent to be proportional to this equation over here, then we actually do better and we get um, uh, an approach that matches the lower bound of 3 minus 2 over n, uh, which is what we would like. So this really is a generalization of a lot of the other uh, results that we had in previous papers. I had a section here on uh, probability distributions, but we're not going to be able to go through it because I'm running out of time. Uh, but the basic idea, very quickly, is to take a fixed distribution, allow the learning algorithm to then sample from the distribution, uh, and then ask uh, what the agents ought to do. Uh, the agents themselves, just to show you a picture, okay, let's, let's sample, right. The mechanism samples m data points, asks agents for the labels, uh, and then you return the result. The question is, would it work to try to use our strategy proof mechanism? The answer is no. Even with a single agent reporting information, we have the same problem that you just mentioned earlier in the talk, which is that he might have a distribution. Okay, this is our distribution of points, and each agent has some kind of partition of the space, but that unlucky third agent on the left side over there has this very small plus region, a very big minus region, but you know, if somebody comes along and samples a point in the plus region, he has an incentive to report minus overall, so he can report minus untruthfully. That's true even if he's the only agent in the world, right? We come in and we sample a point and he says, oh, just by luck he got the little plus region, so, you know, I'm going to say minus anyway, right? So it's not strategy proof. Uh, however, we do have some results which, if uh, the agents don't lie unless they gain at least epsilon, then with high probability there's not going to be an epsilon beneficial lie. And if no one lies, the uh, approximation ratio is close to what we had before, 3 minus 2 over n. Uh, with enough samples, we can drive it uh, close to this approximation ratio, although the uh, number of required samples is polynomial, both in the number of agents n and uh, 1 over epsilon that we're trying to achieve. In the rational approach, the agents will pick a dominant strategy if one exists. Uh, with enough samples, we can also drive it back to that approximation ratio that we were talking about. And in this case, where they only uh, pick a dominant, they always will pick the dominant strategy if it exists. Uh, the number of required samples is polynomial in uh, 1 over epsilon and not on the number of agents. Lots of future work that can be done. Alternative assumptions on the uh, data, really just beginning this work. Uh, other models of strategic behavior like lying about the, the location of the point in addition to the, to the uh, label on the point. Um, relationship between our models and other models that I mentioned like judgment aggregation, special cases, other concept classes, uh, and other loss functions instead of the zero-one loss function. Thank you.